learn everything you need to know to get started with retouching in Adobe Photoshop. I'm Abby Esparza with Envato Touch Plus and even as a surrealist and horror enthusiast, I still use traditional beauty retouching techniques almost daily. From high fashion to candid portraits, most photos are going to benefit from a bit of tweaking, if not just a small amount. In Photoshop Retouching for Beginners, you'll learn all about frequency separation and how you can use it to retouch skin. You'll even be able to create your very own action. We'll also be taking a look at the well-loved Dodge and Burn, which can be used to enhance hair, makeup, and of course, skin. We'll then be smoothing out hair, adding that silky shine. And looking at how you can add life back into a face using simple makeup techniques. Because whether it's bringing back life into dull eyes or switching out whole backgrounds, we'll be touching on all the details, big and small. Small. The raw images for this video were licensed from Simon Bray, a professional portrait photographer based in the UK, thanks Simon, as well as images from Envato Elements. Get premium design assets, actions, fonts, brushes, and much, much more with Envato Elements. My favorite are the portrait images because they're already beautifully retouched just enough, making them perfect for what I normally do, creative compositing. By the end of this course, you'll have all of the basic skills you need to begin your journey into photo retouching. So stay tuned all the way through so you don't miss a thing. Let's jump right into Photoshop retouching for beginners. Welcome to the first stop in Photoshop retouchers for beginners, frequency separation. So what exactly is frequency separation? The biggest clue is in the name, mainly the separation part. Frequency separation is a powerful retouching technique used to retouch a subject's skin without compromising the subject's texture. Separating the low and high frequency information onto their own layers means that you can edit one without affecting the other. Edit out a wrinkle without having to worry about messing with the surrounding area's color or remove redness and not have to worry about messing with that area's skin texture. So let's set up our layers. While creating the layers is easy, let's record an action while we do it. Uh, that way we can instantly reapply the process to images in the future. Go to Window, Actions if you don't already have the Actions panel out, and create a new folder naming it Frequency Separation. Next, make sure the layer you'll be applying the effect to is active. Now select the plus icon to name and start recording your action. Keep in mind this is optional. If you just want to watch me do it first or do it manually a few times before recording, that is 100% fine. If you are recording along with me, however, make sure you follow these steps exactly to ensure this action can be used on other images without any kind of hiccups or wonkiness. For instance, if you click on a different layer while the action is running, you'll have to delete the action and restart. On to creating the actual layers. First hold down Alt and then drag up on the subject's layer to create a copy. Renaming this layer Low. Now hold Alt and drag up on the Low layer to again duplicate it. Naming this layer High. Hide the High layer and then select the Low layer. Let's go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. We want the radius value to be high enough to where it blurs the texture of the skin. This is going to be anywhere from 5 to 10 pixels depending on the image. Close up portrait shots will need a higher radius value while further away shots will need less. Also smaller images will need less while larger high res images will need more. Let's hit OK once we're happy. Now unhide the high layer and select it. Go to Image, Apply Image and enter the following settings. Layer Low, Blending Subtract, Scale 2, Offset 128. Your image should look great with hints of details, almost like an outline of your original subject. Press OK and then we're going to change the layer mode to Linear Light. All there is left to do now is to group the two layers together and name the group Frequency Separation or FS if you're lazy like me. But we still have to finish off our action. Let's stop recording by hitting the square icon. If we run this action now, it would work. But remember how I said that some images need different Gaussian Blur settings? As the action is now, it'll apply the same Gaussian Blur settings to every image, every time. So let's click the empty square next to the action's name. You'll probably get a warning, just press OK. Now, if we ran this action, every dialog box would open. From names to settings, we don't need all that. 
Now, the only box that'll pop up is the Gaussian Blur settings, so you can fine-tune the settings from image to image. With our frequency separation action made, we can finally put it to use, coming up next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Now that we've set up our frequency separation group, it's time to do some retouching. I like to start with the high frequency layer, though there is no set order, and realistically you'll be jumping back and forth between the two. Keep in mind you can also create new layers in between the high and low layers, setting them to different layer modes and using different brushes. However, as this is a beginner's guide, we're going to focus just on those high and low layers themselves. So let's start with the high layer. Quick recap, our high layer contains the subject's skin texture, including things like pores, pimples, and other small blemishes. Let's make sure the high layer is active and then zoom in nice and close to an area that could use a bit of retouching. There are a few different tools you can use on the high layer. The first is the spot healing brush. The main pro of the spot healing brush is its ease of use. Make sure it's set to content aware in the upper toolbar, and then you can just click on the small blemish. Or you can click and drag on any longer lines or wrinkles. So I don't really recommend the spot healing brush as it lacks control, and you might find yourself clicking and undoing, and then clicking and undoing. It's also more likely to create odd-looking, lower-quality pixels, basically replacing natural imperfections with digitally generated <laughs> imperfections. This brings us to my preferred option, the Clone Stamp Tool. The Clone Stamp Tool is nice as you get to choose what pixels are going where. When using the Clone Stamp Tool, make sure to change the brush hardness to around 70%. If the brush is too soft, you'll end up with blurry pixels, too hard, and you'll see the harsh cut-off edges. With the Clone Stamp tool selected, hold Alt to sample a clear area semi-close to the blemish. Not too close, but not so far to where the texture of the skin has changed. Now click and drag over the blemish to stamp the sample texture over, in this case, a wrinkle. One of the cons to using the Clone Stamp tool is that you do run the risk of repeating patterns, which you absolutely do not want. If you see obvious repeating pixels, you can either redo and resample a new area further away, or you can shrink your brush down real small, a sample a new area, and stamp over the repeating pixel, treating it as if it's a blemish itself. You can also lower the Clone Stamp brush's opacity so that instead of completely removing a blemish, you just lessen its appearance. This is especially great for things like prominent wrinkles that are a part of the subject's facial features, things like laugh lines that you might want to lessen but not remove. Which brings me to my last tool for the high frequency layer, uh, the mixer brush. The mixer brush is nice for softly buffering lines and blurring large pores while still keeping some of the skin texture intact. You're going to have to do some tweaking to its settings, however. First, make sure the brush is set to clean brush. Second, have the first brush icon inactive while the second icon is active. This will clean the brush after each stroke uh, so you aren't picking up and mixing colors everywhere. Next, set white, load, mix, and flow all to 15%. You can play with these settings, especially flow. Lowering the flow rate will lessen the overall effect. And since it's really, really easy to go overboard with the mixer brush tool, lowering the flow to 10 or even 5% may be a good idea. And I would not recommend going above 15. You want to use the mixer brush very, very sparingly. Now let's take a look at our low frequency layer. The low layer is ideal for evening out skin tone and removing dark or red spots. And just like with the texture of the skin, the mixer brush can be a useful tool for just that, evening out the skin tone. As well as things like tan lines or even harsh makeup lines. You can also use a Gaussian Blur to smooth out shadows and skin tone. We don't want to blur the whole face, so let's select the lasso tool, setting it to a feather of around 10 pixels. The feather amount will depend on the overall size of your image. 
You want to make sure that when you create a selection, it's soft enough to hide any harsh edges, but hard enough so that you still have control over the area being selected. Now we can select an area we want to smooth out. I try to select areas of the face, separating them into sections and into either light or shadow. So for instance, instead of selecting the forehead, I'll only select the top right section. With our selection, we can go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. The blur will change not only from image to image, but from selection to selection. You do not want to overdo it with this blur. Even with all of the texture over top, too much blur will leave you with weird, plasticky looking skin. Again, use Gaussian Blur with caution, as it's very, very easy to overdo. So here are some general tips to keep in mind when using frequency separation. The mixer tool is great for smoothing out pores and fine lines, but use it with caution or else you'll end up with blurry skin with no detail, completely defeating the purpose of frequency separation. When using the clone stamp tool, beware of repeating pixels and patterns. Even small duplicates can stick out like a sore thumb. Removing fine lines is one thing, but removing large wrinkles or creases in a person's face can suck the life out of the subject's expression. Because finally, always keep in mind that the camera is going to catch and amplify things like blemishes and wrinkles that otherwise would have gone completely unnoticed. Even if you were to be inches from a person's face, that's nothing compared to a giant high-resolution image. When it comes to skin retouching, less is usually more. And that'll end our how-to on frequency separation, because it's not the only skin retouching technique we'll be covering here today. Dodge and Burn is coming up next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Up next is Dodge and Burn. So we just covered frequency separation, and you may be wondering why not just use that all the time? Well, frequency separation is a great tool to have, but can easily lead to excessive smoothing. I like FS for large acne and wrinkles, also things like dirt, debris, and even stray hair strands that fall on the face. However, Dodge and Burn is different in that it pinpoints and targets imperfections and tonal changes on a micro level. All of those small highlights and shadows on the face that are caused by the skin's texture. Every bump, crease, and dip in the skin has a highlight and a shadow. We're talking very, very small highlights and very, very small shadows. And it's these highlights and shadows that disrupt the transition of tonal values, which we want to be smooth. So when should you use one versus the other? Again, I like FS for larger wrinkles, acne, uh, scratches, scabs, or small wounds, and debris. Dodge and Burn is better for fine lines, folds, and bumps, as well as dark spots, shadows, and small creases. The under eye area is a great example. Before dodging and burning, it can be helpful to set up some visual aids that'll amplify and help you see the highlights and shadows. First, a curves layer to darken and add some contrast to the image. And second, a layer set to color and filled with 50% gray. You can do this by going to Edit, Fill, 50% gray. And these two layers will help the imperfections of the skin stand out. Let's group them and place them at the top of our layer stack. We can then flip it on and off as we go. Now onto the actual dodge and burning, which is simple. Dodge the overly dark patches and burn the overly light patches. There are a few different ways to dodge and burn, but the way I was always taught, and I believe to be the most ideal way, is to use curve adjustment layers. Let's create a curves layer and bring down the curve, and then invert the layer mask by hitting Ctrl I, naming this layer Burn. Now let's create a second curves layer and bring up the curve. Once again, inverting the layer mask, we'll name this layer Dodge. Let's group these layers, naming the group D and B. As you dodge and burn, you're going to want to switch your layers off and on to keep an eye on your changes. We have our layers now, so let's set up our brush. We want a round brush set between 0 to 50% hardness. I don't recommend going higher than 50% as you want the brush to remain quite soft. You'll also change this as you go, so I say 25% is a good starting point. 
Next, set the flow to 3%. You want to keep your brush's flow rate low at all times. Realistically, I do recommend using a drawing tablet with pressure sensitivity when dodging and burning, even a cheap one. If you are going to try and use a mouse, then set the flow rate to just 1%. The size of the brush will change as you go, but I like to set it to slightly smaller than whatever blemish I'm filling in. Now let's find a dark spot, select the dodge layer, set our paintbrush to white, and mask. I'm filling in the dark area with a small amount of light until the area is no longer dark and is matching the surrounding tonal value. And then you burn by doing the same thing, but on the burn curve instead. First, when dodging and burning, avoid zooming in too close for too long. I know this seems uh, backwards, but best case scenario, you'll spend a lot of time for very little result. Worst case scenario, you'll end up completely removing the good skin texture, leaving you with overly smooth, plastic, or waxy looking skin. Try and work at a 50% zoom for larger high res images, or just zoom out often and double check yourself. Alternatively, you can open up a secondary zoomed out view of your work using Window, Arrange, New Window 4. Second, avoid excessively dodging highlights. A nice bright highlights can make a face appear fresh and dewy, but overdo it and you'll end up with an almost oily appearance. If you push the highlights even further, then you'll end up with hot spots, which are areas that are pure white with no detail, making a photo appear less realistic or overly retouched. Third, take breaks. It's easy to get in the zone while retouching. There is something almost calming about it, but be sure to take breaks and reset your eyes. That'll help you notice blemishes you may have missed, as well as areas you are a little too enthusiastic about retouching. In my experience, you'll be dealing with more dodging of dark patches than the burning of light spots, but be careful of only dodging. You'll need to burn overly bright areas just as much. And that'll wrap up the beginning of Dodge and Burn. Well loved in the high-end retouching world, but just as powerful for more candid or commercial shots, as well as creative compositing. But we are moving on from skin to hair, coming up next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. With some skin basics down, this is a great time to move on to hair, starting with those pesky flyaways. I have two tools I like to use to tidy up hair. First is the Spot Healing Brush tool. I mentioned earlier how I don't love this tool paired with frequency separation, but it does an amazing job with stray hairs. First, let's create a new layer. Now let's grab the Spot Healing Brush and set it to Content Aware. Now we want to make sure that sample all layers is checked. We want it to be around 60% hardness. Setting the size a bit larger than whatever hair strand you'll be trying to clean up. Then we're just going to click and drag. You're better off making small strokes as trying to erase a long hair all in one go tends to end up with some pixel weirdness. However, this is why we created a new layer and checked sample all layers. If we don't like what we laid down, we can simply erase it. There are roughly 100,000 hairs on any given human's head, so definitely try to get the hair as smooth as possible before taking the shot if you can. If not, the spot healing brush is the way to go. Next up is the clone stamp tool, which works better on areas with lots of close together hair strands. Create another new layer and select the clone stamp tool. Again, setting it roughly to 60% hardness and checking that uh, sample all layers. 
Next, let's use either the lasso tool or pen tool to create a selection around the areas with any frizz uh, you'd like to remove. You'll want to give the edge of the selection a slight feather, around 0.5 pixels should be enough. Then we can just clone stamp the frizz away. Now this image has a very simple background, and when working with an image with a solid color backdrop, you can be a little less careful about how uh, you stamp. Just make sure there are no obvious blotches. The more complicated the background, the more you'll want to be sure to recreate whatever the background is while you stamp. If there's a background but it's extremely out of focus, then again, you don't have to worry too much about recreating it one for one. You just want to get the general gist. My main tip for retouching hair is to make sure it makes sense. While it can be tempting to ditch cleaning up the small strands and just take care of the larger areas of frizz, doing one without the other will make the hair look fake or obviously edited. If the inner hair is frizzy, then that frizz would make its way onto the edges of the hair as well, and vice versa. But do keep in mind, any very dark and very light hair strands can be removed from the face or clothes using frequency separation, the same way you'd remove a wrinkle. Next up, let's go over how to touch up facial hair with some tips and tricks for shaping and retouching beards and mustaches. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Now that we've covered hair on the head, let's talk about the hair on someone's face. Many of the same techniques will apply, but you'll want to approach the facial hair a bit differently. First, I recommend looking at the shape of the facial hair as a whole, particularly around the cheeks. That's where most of the work is going to be needed. For the bulk majority of cleaning up hair, I like to use the spot healing brush tool. I use it the same way I do with the flyaway hairs, only I zoom in much closer and pay much closer attention to the edges of the hair and skin. Any odd looking pixels or overly smooth edges will stand out way more on face skin compared to on a head of hair. Keep the brush small and set to around 70% or so hardness, though you may need to adjust it depending on how in focus the area you're working on is. Make small strokes, keeping an eye on the hairs making up our new beard edge. Sometimes the healing brush tool can create blurry edges or pixels, and we want to be careful to avoid that. So don't be afraid to control Z and undo. Now for those extra long and dark hairs, you can always use frequency separation. Use the clone stamp tool on the high frequency layer, treating that hair as a blemish. Then you can go ahead and smooth out any discoloration left behind on the low frequency layer using either a softer stamp brush tool set to a low flow rate or the mixer brush also set to a low flow rate. Always be careful when using that mixer brush as it's so easy to get carried away with. When retouching more candid portraits, it's best to keep as much of the natural beard shape as possible. Focus more on cleaning up those uneven edges and the more distracting extra long hair strands. And to finish up our quick look at beards, you can make a beard appear a bit fuller using dodge and burn techniques, focusing on the burn portion of dodge and burn. Go ahead and create a curves adjustment layer. Drag down on the curve to darken the image. Fill that layer mask with black using control I. And then very lightly mask in some darkness onto the beard. As always, I recommend bringing your brush's flow rate down to 25% or less. Slow, steady, and subtle are the three S's of photo retouching.
You can also add a lovely shine to hair using dodge and burn techniques, both facial hair and the kind on your head. So let's cover that next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Now that we've cleaned up our hair, we can add a nice healthy shine to it. First, we're going to create a simple hair strand brush. Let's create a new document, any size, and paint three to five semi-close together and in different sizes uh, dots using a black semi-hard round brush. Now we're going to crop the canvas down to size and go to Edit, Define Brush Preset. We can then select the brush, set the spacing to 1, and then go ahead and save that brush once again so that the spacing setting is saved. So next, let's create two curve layers, similar to how we set up our dodge and burn. One will brighten while the other one will darken, but we're going to hold off on adding our layer masks because first we're going to adjust the layers blend if settings. Blend if is located in the layer style panel, which can be accessed by double clicking a layer anywhere outside of its layer name. So let's hide the burn curve layer and double click on the dodge curve. Basically, when using Blend If, we're telling Photoshop to Blend If the underlying layer is a certain brightness value. These toggles set those values. The left toggle will blend the shadows while the right toggle will blend the highlights. Hold Alt and then click and drag the right half of the left toggle just enough to where the darkest portions of the hair won't be affected by the dodge layers. Now we want to hide the dodge layer and then repeat the same process to the burn layer only this time removing the burn from the brightest areas. This blend if setting will change from image to image. Once we're happy, we can flip on each of the curved layers and fill each of their masks using Control I. Grouping the two curves and naming that group Hair Shine. Now all we have to do is paint on the highlights using the dodge layer masks and paint on the shadows using the burn layer. Use the strand brush we made set to a flow rate of just 10% so you can build up both the light and dark areas slowly. For larger areas, you can use a soft round brush. Just make sure to also set that brush to a low flow rate, even lower than 10%. Feel free to skip the blend if settings if you want to completely darken or lighten an area, but if that's the case, I suggest making two groups of curves. One with the blend if settings for a crisper, more defined shine, and a second group for the areas that you want uh, to be more generally bright or dark. And that's how you add some easy shine to hair. Up next, we'll be finishing up our hair, uh, looking at how to adjust hair color in Photoshop retouching for beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop retouching for beginners. Let's finish up our hair with some color adjustment, because if there is one thing that is hard to control, it's hair color. There aren't too many models out there willing to dye their hair for a one-off photo shoot, after all. I have two methods for you, one that requires you to extract hair and one that doesn't. Because I know that for many Photoshop users, extracting hair is not their idea of a fun time. Let's start with the hair extraction method. This method will be ideal for studio shots, fashion shots, or creative compositing. It's for when you want to make a pretty drastic change. So to start, you'll want to duplicate the subject and then extract the duplicated subject's hair and only the hair. This includes extracting it from the subject's face. Think of it like you're making a wig. I recommend the Refine Edge tool for extracting hair most of the time. As this is a studio shot, select subject worked great for an initial selection. Now I'm going to add a layer mask and then refine that layer mask using select a mask and the Refine Edge brush. Making sure Smart Radius is checked and setting the radius to around 3 pixels. Then dragging the brush around the edges of the subject. You can also try hitting the Refine Hair button found up top.
Once your selection is looking okay and you're happy with it, press OK and then right click Convert to Smart Object. Next, you'll want to repeat the process of selecting and refining, only this time on the hair uh, touching the subject's face. I use the lasso tool to make a rough selection and the refine edge brush to, well, refine just like we did before. And once you're done refining, you're going to want to manually remove any large leftover objects, like the flowers in this case, using whatever your preferred attraction method is. Mine tends to be the pen tool, but you can just use a hard round brush or even just the lasso tool, whatever you're most comfortable with. This is what I call a wig layer. Now let's create and clip a hue saturation layer into the wig layer. The hue slider lets you effortlessly choose your perfect color. And since it's an adjustment layer, you can always change it anytime for any reason. The saturation also gives you a ton of control and you can bring the slider all the way down if you're looking for a silver hair effect. Hair isn't all about color, however. You can use a brightness contrast or curves adjustment layer to brighten or darken hair. I prefer curves as you get more control over the shadows of the hair, but a brightness contrast can work just as well. And remember that hair strand brush we made? It can come in handy if you need to further refine the mask. Just grab the brush, set it to white, and mask back in the areas that refine edge may have missed. You can also mask away areas using black if refine edge grabbed a little too much of the subject's skin tone. Now, if you don't want to mess with a layer mask and you are looking for a more subtle change, then you are better off just using layer modes and a soft touch. Go ahead and create a new layer and set it to color. Choose the color you'd like to tint your hair with. And then choose a soft round brush set to a flow rate of just 10%. Now just brush on your tint, slowly building up the color. You can then use the hair strand brush to pinpoint any smaller areas and edges of hair. works particularly well on blonde or lighter hair, but can still add a tint of color to even dark, dark black hair. When working with dark hair, just change the layer mode to color dodge. And that brings us to the end of the hair section. And we're moving on to makeup and eyes. Next in Photoshop retouching, for beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for beginners. With the hair all done, we can move on to makeup. When it comes to cleaning up makeup and eyes, we've luckily already touched on the two most used tools, and that is the spot healing brush and the clone stamp tool. So for the eyebrows, you can use the spot healing tool to clean up any stray hairs, clicking and dragging just like before. Try to focus on any single hairs that are kind of far off from the brow. Trying to use the spot healing brush too close to the edge of the main eyebrow uh, tends to leave you with a blurry and odd looking edge. If the edge of the brow is what you need to clean up, however, the clone stamp tool will be much, much more effective. 
Sample an area of the skin close to the eyebrow, and then with a semi-hard round brush, uh, sharpen up the edge of the brow. Remember, we're doing both our spot healing and clone stamping on their own layers, so we can erase and adjust without worrying about our base image being affected. For eye makeup, you can use the clone stamp tool just like with the eyebrows uh, to clean up and sharpen the eyeliner. But for the eyes themselves where you may be dealing with veins, for instance, the healing brush will do a much better job. Set to lighten, and then with a diffusion of 7 for a softer edge. Now let's hold Alt and select a white part of the eye, and then click and drag over the red veins. I like to create and name a new layer for each part that is being retouched. So two spot healing layers, one for the brows and one for the eyes. Two clone stamp layers, one for the eye makeup and one for the brows as well. This will just offer a bit more flexibility. But if you forget to switch layers like I often do, then it's no biggie. Finally, for the lips, the clone stamp tool works to remove feathered or smudged lipstick. However, sometimes sharpness can be created by uh, creating a fuller or a more intense makeup effect. For that, you want dodge and burn. Makeup intensity is coming up next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. We're going to finish up our eyes, eye makeup, and lips by looking at how to intensify the makeup itself. In camera, makeup can come out dull and lack the visual punch it originally had. For this, we're going to want to use good old dodge and burn. Let's start with our brows as we can make a pretty big difference here. Let's create our dodge and burn curves, one dark, one light, and then select a semi-soft round brush set to a flow of 5%. Now we can fill in the overly thin areas using the burn layer, giving the appearance of a thicker and more even brow. For the edge of the brow, however, we want to switch out our brush to the custom hair strand brush we made earlier. With this brush, we can elongate the end of the brow, as well as sharpening its point by masking on the burn layer. We can also create the appearance of a sharper brow by just slightly dodging the edges of the brow, lightening that area. And lips work the same exact way. Dodge the edges to give the appearance of a clean, sharp edge while burning the color to make it darker and more prominent. If wanting the lips to appear plumper, then dodge the highlights while burning the inner lips and shadowy areas. And while it can be tempting to go heavy on the lip shine, try to keep a light hand, building both the dodge and burn layers up slowly. For the eyes, I like to first uh, whiten the white part of the eye to make it a bit clearer and brighter. To do this, let's create a vibrance adjustment layer, setting the vibrance to negative 100. Next, let's set the opacity of that layer to just 50%, and then fill the layer mask with black. Now we can use a soft round brush uh, set to a low flow rate, as always, to fill in the whites of the eyes. Being careful to avoid the skin and iris. This will just knock out some of the red and yellow that tends to pop up in a lot of people's eyes. You can always decrease the opacity of this layer if your eyes are looking a little gray.
And with the whites of the eyes cleaned up and whitened, we can now work on the iris. Let's create some dodge and burn curves layers, filling their layer masks with black just like before. But now we're going to also change their layer modes. We're going to change the burn curve to color burn and the dodge layer to color dodge. Let's create a selection around the iris using the elliptical marquee tool, giving it a slight feather of 5 pixels. Now let's group our new dodge and burn layers together and add a layer mask to the group. If you find the layer mask is a little too harsh, you can always increase the feather by double clicking the layer mask. And finally, we can burn the dark spots of the eyes and dodge the highlights using the layer masks of each curve. As always, use a soft brush with a very low flow rate, even as low as 1%. The size will change as well. Use a larger brush for building up larger, more general areas of shadow and a smaller brush for pinpointing spots of bright highlight. You can start by just enhancing the current light and shadow of the eye. Then start to intensify the light being caught in the bottom part of the iris and the shadows being cast towards the top. If at any time the dodge is too bright or the burn is too dark, you can always lower the opacity of the layer. And the same layers we use for the iris enhancement can be used for the makeup as well. Let's create two more dodge and burn layers in their own group and then dodge the highlights and burn the shadows. The inner eye, top middle of the lid, and right below the highest point of the eyebrow are all great places to add light, while the lash line, eyelid crease, and corners of the eyelid are great places to add shadow. If there's any eyeliner, you'll likely want to darken it with burn. And if the waterline is nude, then a touch of dodge can brighten the eye and make the subject look more awake. Let's finish up our face with some blush and contour, next time in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. So after doing some skin retouching, like frequency separation, um, you can always go back in with one final pass of dodge and burning. But this dodge and burn will be specifically for contouring the face. So let's set up our last group of dodge and burn layers. Now with a 100% soft round brush set to a flow rate of just 1%, we're going to bring out the highlights and deepen those shadows. For the shadows, make sure to hit the areas right below the lip and nose, as well as the hollows of the cheeks. Hitting that lip area will make the lips appear fuller, while deepening the hollows of the face will bring out a person's cheekbones. The highlights will hit on the tops of the cheeks, the bridge and tip of the nose, the cupid's bow area, which is right above the lips and below the nose, and then a little bit on the forehead. Change your brush size as you go, using larger brushes for more general shadows, but also shrinking the brush down for more precise highlights and shadows. Using overly large brushes can often remove the structure of the face, making everything kind of blurry and formless. And when working with candid or more natural images, don't push the contouring too far, but a high fashion studio shot can take a bit more if you really want that dramatic effect. Be sure to retain the model's original skin tone, I'm being very, very careful not to overly lighten. And remember, you can always lower the opacity of the dodge and burn layers if you find the effect is just a bit too intense. Now on to blush, which is the secret to healthy looking skin. Maybe it's not a secret, but sometimes I do think people are a little bit afraid of blush. 
or retouchers, not really thinking, end up accidentally retouching it away as if it's uneven redness, resulting in flat, lifeless skin. Luckily, adding blush is incredibly easy. Create a new layer ideally above all your current retouch layers and set it to multiply. Now select a blush color, nothing too saturated or dark, as the multiply layer mode will darken and saturate any color placed on it. Next, with a soft brown brush set to a flow of 1%, paint some color onto them cheeks. I also like to bring color onto the nose and chin, however this is a much more stylized take on blush. You can always just add it to the upper cheek and temple areas, the more traditional spots. But this will also do a good job of showing off the next step, which is double clicking the blush layer and then pulling the left half of the left toggle in blend if inwards. This will remove the blush from the highest points of the face, the highest highlights of the face, bringing back some of its dewiness and making it seem less flat. The amount you adjust your blend if setting will 100% depend on your image. Different lighting and different skin tones will all affect the blend if settings. I tend to bring down the opacity of the blush layer to around 75% as well, to make sure it's not too intense. It's time to finish things up with some background enhancements, coming up next in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. Welcome back to Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. For our last lesson, we'll be looking at how to enhance and add some quick and easy texture to a studio background without any precise compositing needed. So let's grab a texture or scene we'd like to add. I find textures work a bit better, but as you can see here, things like skies and clouds can work just as well. One of my favorite things to add though to a plain studio background is a slightly grungy concrete texture. So let's place the texture and set the layer mode to soft light. Now let's adjust the saturation level using hue saturation. I like to knock out a good 50% of the texture saturation most of the time, sometimes 100%, but it will all depend on both the main image and texture and your desired effect. So just play around with it. And then once happy, duplicate that texture and change the layer mode to overlay. This will intensify the texture. You might end up bringing the opacity of this layer down a bit if the texture is too intense looking, however. Let's group these two layers together and then mask out the subjects using a soft round brush. When masking the edges of the subject, use a small brush so you can get a semi-hard edge. You can also try using the Select Subject tool as it tends to work very, very well on uh, studio backgrounds. And this is optional, but depending on the depth and focus of your image, it may be a good idea to add a slight Gaussian blur to both of your textures. Here, my model's shoulder is out of focus, which means her background would be too. However, if the subject is in focus up completely with no blurry background, no depth of field, then leaving the background sharp is perfectly fine. And that is all there is to easily enhancing a background without having to go through the trouble of selecting a subject by hand, no pen tool necessary. And with that, it's time to wrap things up and do a quick recap of all that we've learned here. Next time in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. And we're at the final stop in Photoshop Retouching for Beginners. So let's do a quick recap. Frequency separation separates an image into a high frequency layer containing detail and a low frequency layer containing values and color. It's ideal for larger blemishes, wrinkles, imperfections, as well as for cleaning up dirt or debris. It's also perfect for evening out skin tone and removing redness. For smoothing out skin, removing bumps and dark shadows, then you'll want to use dodge and burn. 
add light to overly dark areas and shadow to overly light areas, creating a perfectly smooth transition of values. Just remember to be careful when retouching skin, that going too far will suck the life out of a face. Dodge and Burn doesn't stop at skin though, use it to add a dose of shine to hair. Whether you want a natural sheen or a full on shampoo commercial level of shine is up to you. For retouching hair, the spot healing tool will take care of most of those loose pesky hair strands, while the clone stamp tool will knock out the outer frizz. With both the spot healing and clone stamp tool being great options for cleaning up makeup. And if you want to add a little extra texture to your studio shots, try adding a background using a mixture of layers set to overlay and soft light. And since Envato Elements has no shortage of images and graphics to choose from, with no daily download limit, my favorite part, you'll be able to find the perfect backdrop every time. And I also want to thank Simon Bright once again for those wonderful portraits. And with that, I sincerely hope you had as much fun as I did covering the basics of retouching. I'm Abby Esparza with Envato Touch Plus, and this was Photoshop Retouching for Beginners.